Howdy how YouTubers and welcome back to another video. So in this video I'm going to give you my five top tips on how to build your own lake. For those of you that are looking to build your own lake or establish a fishery, uh, here are my top five tips of my experience of it and uh, how I went about it. I've had a lot of um, messages and uh, DMs recently about uh, my fishery, how I went about things, what to do and things like that. So I thought I'd make a quick fire video of uh, my five top tips of what you need to do to get started. So tip number one is uh, obviously you need a plot of land to be able to build a fishery with. This stage is probably actually your most important stage because you need to be able to establish quite a lot of things before you even think about doing these things. The first thing you need to look at is the actual area, whether it's suitable to build a lake or a pond in the vicinity. Uh, things like what you have around you, um, will it fit in and tie in with the landscape. One of the most important things you'll need to know is uh, how well the ground is capable of holding water. Um, clay is an ideal soil. Um, things like shillet and rock are things that you don't want to be finding in the in the land that you're going to be doing it with because it has a very high permeability and it will just seep through. Same as things like sand and things of that nature, anything coarse. Other things you need to look out for are things like how are you going to be able to fill the lake? Um, do you have a water source near you that you could possibly tap into? Though you do need permission for that sort of thing and I'll go into that a little bit later. Um, land drains are a very, very good, effective way to fill lakes, um, but you need to be able to find a way to be able to keep that water level at a constant. With my lake, um, as I said before, during my uh, documentary, I had a series of springs uh, in and around the, the land that I use. So um, my lake constantly fills up with uh, land water and uh, land drains. And that keeps it pretty much topped up all the time. It does drop down a little bit, but um, you will get that in the in the warmer months and the dry periods. So that's the first thing that you need to really look at before you do anything. Okay, uh, don't go making drawings and going, oh, this is what I'm going to do. Because when you come to build it, the chances are it won't happen like that. The best thing to do is get yourself a digger or hire a digger. There are contractors out there that will do this sort of thing for you. They will do what are called test holes. What's a test hole? Well, a test hole is basically a series of holes that they will dig in the ground for you. Um, they'll do it all around the site. So I had, I think, seven or eight done. Um, looking at the field, you just think, you know, I oh, will just do one hole and that would be it. But that was my thinking of it when I when I first started. You know, you find you dig a hole, it's going to be the same everywhere. Totally not the case. So in my field, the top end of the field was absolutely round with shillet. It was completely no good. It was just a rock formation. It couldn't be used whatsoever. So um, make sure you get them test holes done. Go down to a depth of around two meters. That should cover you off for your your lake needs most of the time if you're going to have a really deep lake go a little bit deeper than that but two meters is usually around the kind of ballpark figure that you want to be aiming for and just dig those holes all around the site that way you'll be able to see inside of those holes and you'll be able to see the formation of the layers in the in the soil as to what kind of um what kind of soils that you have um, most most companies out there, most drivers, they'll be able to tell you exactly what the, the, the layers are in the ground and whether or not you're going to have a, an ideal situation to sort of like, you know, complete your project with. Um, if you've got to start importing materials like clay and things like that, it can get really, really expensive. I didn't have to do that because I had the material available to use here. So that being said as well, you'd, you'd also need to find a way of uh, draining off your lake without affecting the land around you. So uh, whether that be a nearby ditch, nearby stream, um, 
nearby water course, anything like that, uh, just where you can flow that water away in the wet months uh, and not affect anything around you. That's a really, really big factor when it comes to your planning permission and things like that. So you've got to make sure also that you can fill your lake, but you've also got to make sure you've got a way of emptying it in a safe and efficient manner. So all that being out of the way, you've done all of those steps. Um, the second tip that I would give you that would be your next stage would be to start looking at how you're gonna lay this lake out. This can also be done with a uh, contractor. Um, if you're using a contractor, I use the contractor for mine because um, I didn't have the equipment to do it with and I knew that there was a lot of ins and outs of building fisheries from my previous experience of working with um, a local fishery to me uh, who talked me through the process of what they did when they had one of their legs done. So yeah, that's gonna be one of your big things is to look at what you actually can do because there will be instances where it's just not feasible to maybe follow the plan exactly how you want it. And that was a thing with mine at the time. Um, we had to make it a little bit shorter in length because of the, the variations in the land. So price wise uh, for the contractors and things like that, um, you're probably looking at around £10,000 per acre. Um, that's kind of like the ballpark figure of what these things cost nowadays. Um, just because of the machinery that's involved, um, it is a lot of work definitely um, and if you've never done it before and you think oh well I've got a digger I'll just do it myself it will be the worst thing that you can do if you don't know what you're doing it's actually quite a heavily structural um, engineering project to, to be able to achieve a bowl of water that will hold water it's not just the case of just oh we'll just put a swing shovel in the field and you know dig a hole it doesn't work like that at all it will never hold water um, you know, I had to have a damn wall constructed on mine, uh, as you've seen in, in the uh, in the documentary that I did. Um, you know, and that thing was engineered to the absolute maximum. You would not believe the amount of work that they put into that to just make it so that it wouldn't like lose water. What they do is they put the damn wall in, and underneath it, there's a key trench. Now, a key trench is a solid line of clay. It stops that water from running in underneath so that's all compacted into the ground and then to build the dam wall what they actually do is they start to take this they took the 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 clay from the, the higher point of the higher point of my site down to the lower point and what they did was they spread it they tipped it out with um trailers and tractors and buckets um and then they had a roller a big vibrating roller kind of like the things you see on the roads um, and they rolled it and vibrated it. And they did that for absolutely days to make sure that that whole, that whole section was compacted and couldn't move. Because without that, the water will just run away. So now you've got to the stage where you've done your test holes, the water holds well, um, you've, your contractor's been out, you've looked at everything, everything's good to go. So your next stage is how you want to lay your lake out. You do that with, you know, your contractor. Uh, you do a couple of drawings for him. This is what I want to do. Um, and he'll look at it and, you know, just as a rough, all you need is a rough sketch. You don't need a CAD drawing or anything like that at that stage. Um, he'll tell you, you know, yeah, that, you know, this will work, this will work, you know, or this won't work within your budget. You know, for, for me, um, as I said, we had to shorten mine a little bit because, if I wanted to go the extra, I think it was 30 yards, it was going to cost another seven grand just because of the excavation that was involved because of the levels of the site. So, um, yeah, I turned that down, funnily enough. Um, and, uh, yeah, you, uh, you really need to get on top of that um, to find out, you know, exactly where you are. But it's a relatively easy process. Right, tip number three is your planning permission stage. Now this one, uh, you'd think, oh yeah, you know, I've spent all, spent a load of money already. I've had someone come out, I've had test holes dug and 
we've gone through quotes and he's quoted me this much and I've spent this much already, we must be nearly at the end of it. Nah, <laughs> nowhere near it. So uh, now you're on to the planning permission stage. So you've now got to get your planning permission. Now, planning permission is an absolute must, right? There is no way on earth I would ever consider or advise anyone on just going out and doing this without getting your planning permission. Because if you do, they will be round to shut you down before you start. Not only will they shut you down, they'll serve you with what's called an enforcement notice. Now an enforcement notice is basically a, a notice from the council telling you that you have an unplanned or um, unauthorised lake, whatever, um, and you need to fill it in. Not only do you need to fill it in, you need to pay a half, hefty massive fine as well. And this has to be done within 14 days. So definitely, whatever you do, do not miss this stage. It's expensive, but without it, it will cost you three times as much. Anyway, planning permission. So, um, planning permission wise, uh, you have to approach your local council. Um, some councils do a thing called a uh, pre-planning application. Now, I, I decided to do this with my council. A pre-planning application is basically, you go to the council, you tell them your ideas, a councillor will look at it, and he'll decide whether or not your, um, your project is feasible and the likelihood of it having planning permission. They won't give you an absolute yes or no whether it's going to get planning permission, but they will tell you what your chances are um, and whether or not it's uh, whether it's not something you can achieve or they'll look at it and say it's not even worth bothering with because they have a list. Um, the council will have a, um, a list of targets that they've got to meet every single year um, and one of them will be uh, the biodiversity um, side of things. Uh, and that's where your lake will come into it. So I did the pre-planning application. I told them what I wanted to do, um, showed them my drawings, showed them the land. Um, they will come out and have a look at it, whether or not you're there or not. Um, I know that mine did. Uh, they just drove out, looked at the field, uh, looked at the surroundings, made sure it would sit in situ with, you know, what was around me. They were happy enough. And I got a letter through basically telling me, you know, if you decide to go for planning permission, the likelihood is that you will get it, uh, providing that you meet the criteria. So the criteria they give you a list of, um, and it's basically like things like um, improving the landscape, uh, improving the visual effects, improving the wildlife. You have to be able to prove all of these things to get your planning permission. Now this is where it becomes a little bit expensive before you've even done anything because you have to go out and you have to get all these silly little reports. Um, I had to have a geolog geologist out to make sure that there was no um, no bloody hidden village in my field for whatever reason. Um, it also goes on the SSCI, which is uh, kind of like your... Um, can't remember what the the actual thing for it is is but basically whether or not i'm in a green belt uh so whether or not the land could be used or not i don't know why i had to get that because it was a farm field anyway uh but you have to get one of those oh i did anyway i had to have a photography yeah, photography um photography statement done which was basically someone coming out to my field walking around with a laser level taking all the levels in the field even though we'd done it um, you still have to have that side of it done because you have to be able to prove it to the council so they can see your plans. Um, you have to have a plan of your lake as well. Uh, so I made the mistake at first of doing my own drawings. I don't advise that at all because I took my drawings there and they were like, we can't use those. It has to be done by a, architect, a qualified architect. So you have to go out and do all these little little statements and the whole thing's a pain in the ass. So you really have to like grit your teeth with it. Um, it's a long old process because 
you've got to make sure you've got all your paperwork with it. Otherwise, the, you'll put you'll put the planning application in, and the council will just come back to you and go, nope, you need this. So you've got to make sure that you do all of these little things. So everything that came back on the uh, the um, the pre planning application. Make sure you've got all your surveys and things like that, because if you don't, it will just hold you up. Um, the planning application itself, uh, it costs, it well, depending on your council again, um, but for me, it was £462 per 0 0.1 hectare that I wanted to turn into a lake and excavate. So that ended up uh, at one hectare i think i used in the end so 462 times 10 i'll let you do the maths i'm telling you one thing it's not cheap um so the whole process for the planning application you're probably looking at it depending on how big you want to build your lake um my planning application cost me around six and a half seven grand so yeah not cheap Another thing with the planning application is when it goes through, um, it has to be approved by all these different bodies. So you'll have the environment agency get involved um, and what they'll do is they'll write reports of, uh, basically the council will forward your application to them. They'll say, this is what he wants to do. Um, they'll look at it and say, yes, it's a viable thing. You know, we can, we can, we can support that or we can't support that. And that's where the, uh, the kind of decision making's done so i had the support from the environment agency um it also goes to the highways because you have to be able to prove that um your access is safe how much busier you're going to make the roads um things of that nature um so that was all okay for me i didn't have any problems with those uh, it also goes to your local parish council if you have one um i live out in the sticks so i've got a parish council here uh, they were fully behind it and I didn't have any problems there. And then you come to your locals. Now for me, I had the support of absolutely everyone. I had no problems whatsoever, but you always get one Norman. So it's your typical story, really. I had a, I've got a guy that lives in the village. You know, he lived here for he's lived here for three years. The first thing he did when he moved here was build a bloody extension on his house, but that was all right we didn't say anything about that but um yeah first thing he did was write this massive letter to the council about how he didn't want it how it was going to be how it was going to be an eyesore how it wasn't going to fit in with the surroundings how it wasn't going to attract wildlife now you really have to be quite diplomatic when you're dealing with this sort of thing because this sort of thing can really sort of like upset your planning commission side of it and really rock the boat and hold things up um, luckily enough, I responded in the in the right way, which was basically talk to my local parish council, um, explained, like, look, you know, this is what it's going to be, uh, you know, in, into a little bit more detail. I did a question and answers form for anyone within the within the village, um, that if they had any concerns or that they had any any issues. Um, that I could address some of the some of the questions. So I got asked a few questions um, that I answered. You know, one was uh, outside of the gate. There's a like a lay by. Um, they asked whether or not that was going to be um, you know kept there as a lay by, or whether there was going to be cars in it all day for fishing. But I've got my own car park, so I managed to answer it with no, because um, I knew that what the planning stages would require that from the highways uh, to show that I had my own parking um and things of that nature so not only did i do that but this guy also wrote another letter bruh bruh in response to my questions and answers this is unbelievable you wouldn't believe it you'd think i was building a tower block but i wasn't i was building a lake um and he was he was adamant oh i'm gonna turn it into a campsite da -da 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 -da. So I responded to it and said, it's not going to be a campsite. Like no one said anything about a campsite. You know, oh, if there's going to be night fishing, it's going to be camping. Night fishing isn't camping. You obviously know nothing about what you're talking about. 
Um, you're just getting involved for the sake of it. And that's what pretty much everyone in, in the vicinity thought and still does think. So um, just be aware because you will have people out there that will try to stop what you're doing, trip you up for absolutely no reason. You don't even know them, um, but they will get involved and you have to go about things the right way. Don't go around to someone's house with a baseball bat because it's just not worth the time. It can be a really, really frustrating and stressful process. Um, it takes probably about eight to 10 weeks to get a decision from the council. Uh, and it makes it quite stressful when you're when you're battling with things like that as well in the background. I, I'm sure it's just done just for the sake of it, but you really have to take it on the chin. Um, I know what I did with mine and I know that if I decided to do anything else here, I'm pretty sure that if I did it sensibly, I wouldn't have a problem from anyone apart from that guy. So, you know, but uh, there, there are certain arguments that you can make in planning. Um, so mine was uh, the, the objection that I had was uh, along the lines of, you know, Oh, it's going to look rubbish. Oh, it's going to this. It's going to that. But the guy doesn't live here. It doesn't affect him. So in the council's eyes, it's not a valid argument for an objection because he doesn't live anywhere near here. He lives half a mile down the road. So, yeah. Um, but it's, it's, it's a stressful... Uh, it's a stressful experience because if you don't get your planning, it's going to cost you another load of money. It's not like they say to you, "Oh, well, sorry, you can't have your, you can't have your planning permission. Uh, here's your money back." It doesn't work like that. So you've got to make sure you hit it round the first time properly. So luckily for me, my planning permission went through on the first time, um, despite what you know Norman had said down the road uh it all went through perfectly no problems whatsoever um I had one tie with with my planning application and that was that it was approved in the February um but I wasn't able to start digging until the September and that was because of the bird nesting season because I had um, some rushes in the field from where the springs were and the, the ground was quite wet. Um, the uh, ecologist had said that, uh, you know, it was it was a minimal habitat for bird breeding. We'd never had bird breeding in the field at all, but, um, you know, it, it, because they were there, it was a habitat for it. So I had to wait until the bird nesting season was over, which was in the September. And as soon as September came around, I was able to start getting my project underway. So tip number four would be time of year. Now, this is quite an important one as well, um, because there's only certain times of the year that you're really able to sort of like construct a lake. You can't really do it in the depths of winter because everything is so wet and damp and waterlogged. Uh, it will take you forever to try and achieve those goals. The best time of years to, well, the best time of year to really to construct a lake is ideally in the uh in the spring the start of spring so your aprils and your mays um that's kind of like when everything's starting to dry out a little bit the soil is nice and workable then um and uh yeah that's uh that's a really good time to do it the middle of summer not so clever because everything is so dry um and you can end up with problems with compaction and yeah, the soil not being workable enough so that can hold you up and the other so the other best time to do it is in the fall so really you're looking at the april and the may or you're looking at the september october possibly the november um again when things start to cool down and uh the soil's a little bit more workable it just it's just a thing for the machine drivers um and it will also benefit you as well because you know you'll be getting a, a job done properly. Um, so like I said, I had mine done in September. Um, it did rain in between those periods, as you've probably seen on the on the documentary and things like that. But it was still good enough to be able to get the job done. So tip number five would be uh, be prepared. Be very prepared because it's a really, really complex task. There's a lot to it. 
um, and it's very, very time consuming. I started planning my project in 2017 and uh, it wasn't until 2020, the September of 2020, when I actually got to put a digger in the field and start start the work on, on the place. So um, just be prepared. Um, it's expensive. Uh, there's no getting around that. Like trying to save costs is just going to trip you up. So I wouldn't even advise like trying to do it yourself if you don't know what you're doing. If you do know if you do know what you're doing and you do have the equipment to do it, fair play to you, carry on. Um for me it wasn't like that. So I decided to get someone in to do the construction and the digging and the excavating because when I saw what was involved with it I was glad I never undertook it myself. There would have been absolutely no way I would have been able to make the project work. Um, so yeah, that that's it really. Be prepared for the expense because that's ongoing. That, that will never stop. And uh, yeah, enjoy it is the main thing. Try and enjoy it. Um, there were times where I absolutely hated it and I wanted to kick it to the curb and go, that's it because I was just spending so much money. But um when I got to the end of it, I was, um, yeah, very, very pleased with it all. So, uh, yeah, there you go. That's all I can tell you, really. If you do have any more questions, then please ask me. I'll, I'll be quite happy to, to, to answer them. Like I said, I have been getting a lot of like DMs and, and messages asking me about, you know, oh, I'm going to do this. I've just bought a plot of land. I want to do this. How did you do this? So hopefully that will give you a general idea of um, how things are done or how, how I did things anyway. Right, until my next video, tight lines, and I shall catch you soon.